Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever in the world you are joining us, welcome to a very special conversation on climate. My name is Liz McKeon, and at IKEA Foundation, I head our work on climate action. And together with a small team, we use our resources, resources that you all make possible, to help organizations and projects reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we can live within planetary boundaries. Today, it is my extraordinary honor and privilege to be able to have a conversation with someone you all know, um, Jesper Brodin, the CEO of Inca, and we're going to talk about climate. Hello, Jesper. Hey, Hi. Liz. Great to see you. I'm fine. I'm in the Helsingborg store here, and it's a good place to be. So Love a good place to talk about climate, too. Okay, great. Well, you know, Jesper, I thought that maybe rather than me just interviewing you or you interviewing me, we could ask each other questions. Is that an okay idea for you? I, I think so. We'll give it a try. Okay. All right, great. Well, let's start and kick off with the first question. I think it's mine, so I'm going to go ahead. So Jesper, Inca Group has a bold people and planet positive commitment by 2030. Can you share some of the big steps that you're going to take to help reach that objective? Very good. Uh, you can say Inca Group as an entity, but also IKEA in the whole network have made a very strong commitment to uh, climate, and that is to become uh, climate positive already by 2030. Um, so in, in the um, approach lies a lot of actions and an insight in the whole carbon footprint, which in technical terms is referred to as scope three. That means we not only look at the direct uh, footprint that we have uh, in carbon in the in the group but also the impact we have basically being in uh, the furniture industry from the forest all the way to customers so we try to address the totality which is uh, really challenging but also uh, provides opportunities and it's the right uh, thing to do by the way so in, in all of that you can say the question on why is that important for us um, so we have realized uh, since uh, years, and it's been growing with us, an insight that uh, on one hand, with the facts that we have right now on the climate change in the world, this is simply something that we can't hand over to the next generation. Uh, secondly, we see, which is a reason in itself, we see how our coworkers, how customers care more for this topic. And it's a strong belief with us that in the future, they will follow leaders, uh, companies and brands that uh, take their responsibility. Now, the third part, which I love to talk about, is that th this is not charity. This is really built on what we believe is the new uh, business model of the future. So doing what is right for climate means doing right for resources. And also is then linked to a typical IKEA approach on cost in the future. So it's basically uh, trying to combine all of these reasons as we move forward. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Liz. Now I'm going to ask you, uh, Liz, maybe on the same... Um, Note here, um, we work on uh, with a similar vision on two ends of the um, uh, IKEA specter and Ingvar's vision to be for the money. Uh, and do you see from a philanthropical perspective a way to actually influence a business or is this two different worlds as you see it? Yeah, yeah it's a great question, Jesper. You know, um, it's quite true that philanthropy often works on big problems in society and they don't always naturally work with business. But when we started thinking about our approach to climate, it, it dawned on us that if we're gonna survive the climate crisis and reduce greenhouse gas levels to pre-industrial levels, climate action is everyone's responsibility, whether you're a corporation, a government, an investor, or a consumer. And so we started building out what we believe are ecosystems of change makers through something that we like to call unprecedented collaboration. Now, collaboration isn't always a natural thing for business. I mean, businesses compete after all, right? So what can we do as a philanthropy? We began by building platforms and initiatives to engage business, to produce the kind of data that they needed to make better decisions, the things that they could sign up for, for the very reasons that you described, because it's not just good business practice, it also makes sense for the planet. And we even created instruments to help businesses measure their footprint and then reduce it in line with the science, something called science-based targets. So we feel that it's really, really important. And actually, if you think about it, it's super important to involve businesses in this problem because of their scale, because of their influence around the planet, the way they reach markets in every corner of the globe, mm. and the way that they can make fast decisions. So for us as a philanthropy, working with business is a key. Mm. Great. I think it's my turn to ask. Okay, Jesper, 
Ah, I like this question. So if Ikea Foundation were sitting on a shelf in an Ikea store, what name would you give us? And don't be at all persuaded by what I'm holding. <laughs> well, you know what, uh, talking about soft toys, I think one of the classic icons in Ikea is the Famnig, um, the heart uh, cushion soft toy uh, with, uh, with big, uh, big arms. Um, I think that has been a, uh, become a symbol for us in many ways. There's a beautiful story behind that also about um, uh, the project was actually um, an industry in India that failed to live up to new demands for safety, um, for eyes, uh, stitching, etc. And one of our designers went there to basically save the factory and family came out as a product. So that's a good example. But I must say also uh, uh, cl close to my heart and to the topic, I would also mention the range of bamboo products that we have recently over the last uh, six, seven years since uh, uh, seen growing in our range has been an absolutely lovely project and it's an icon to both uh, doing good for planet and what's good for, for uh, business. And finally, um, every time I look at a product that is made uh, by the Social Entrepreneurship Initiative, it gives a bit of extra depth, I think, and proudness uh, um, uh, to what I like in the IKEA range. So I, I think I will ask the same question to you, Liz. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite uh, uh, product in the range? Well, actually, the, that's easy for me. And I'm going to give you two answers, in fact. Um, the first is any appliance that you have that's A plus energy rated or higher, because to me, that's the future. And that's where I, I love I love seeing those evolutions in the stores. And the second is a, a bit more sentimental for me, but it's actually your LED um, lighting. Mm. And the reason is, is that shortly after I came to IKEA Foundation, um, the stores completely shifted from incandescent bulbs and only put LEDs on its shelves. And I remember at the time speaking to someone from the business who said, look what happens if we take leadership. Overnight, we create 900 million new environmentalists. And I remember that was so powerful and so touching to me, who's worked on social issues her whole life, you know, that I, I it really captured me. So whether it's the, forgive my Swedish pronunciation, Riet, or the Tradfrei, or the Lunum. I just love LEDs. I'm all about your LEDs. <laughs> I have no clue what you just said. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, it was good, Liz. No, I think what actually I was, I had the pleasure to be in the room when the decision was uh, taken, must have been 2014 or thereabouts, maybe even earlier on the LED. And that was uh, interesting enough, I think, a good example of a leap of faith. So there was not evidence that it was actually going to be a good business, which it has become, uh, but it put us uh, in the leading position where uh, the trigger was, I think, take the decision and then use economy of scale, innovation and collaboration to, to drive something with speed. So that's, I think it's a lovely example. Thank you so much. Uh, Liz, next question to you. No, next okay. question to me. Sorry. Yeah, ah. next question for you. So Jesper, IKEA is known to drive action and to be a leader in creating a fair and equal society that benefits the many people. So can you help us understand some of the examples of how that principle translates into the business? Yeah, I think, you know, we have uh, two interlinked uh, streams really in uh, sustainability. And so we even call our strategy people and planet uh, positive. So it's both people and planet. Now, to start with, um, the vision of IKEA is to be for the many people. And obviously that was set out um, from a business perspective to serve people in life at home with affordable solutions for life at home. But it's, it's uh, been something that has grown uh, to expand into our total value chain in the 90s and early 2000s when we uh, developed and implemented code of conduct out in the industry dimension of IKEA, which has is taken basically to all corners of uh, the network. Um, uh, I would say uh, the way we have worked for many years with inclusion when it comes to gender equality and other topics, um, I think it's doing what's right, what's a uh, modern view on people. But it's also here, not uh, about charity. If you drive topics like gender equality, you suddenly find yourself to have double as many talents to, to choose from, etc. So again, the way we try to combine doing the right thing, but also making what is good for business is how we view uh, the people again. And there's a lot of things to be said about the future in this aspect too. Obviously, the climate topic, uh, the climate issue and the solution of it needs to be tied uh, to people topics. So for instance, uh, that we drop the illusion of that 
uh, people should pay a premium for sustainability or climate friendly and such things. Uh, we need to be what we um, always have been, to be for the many people and use that as an advantage to make good in the world, but also make good business. Now I think it's my turn to ask you. It's a new thing for me, this every second question. Uh, I never get to that point around the dinner table at, at home, so, uh, uh, but let's see. So Liz, uh, the foundation is, uh, yeah, the foundation is of course known since many years. I think a lot of us know, know, uh, know it from um, supporting uh, children, livelihoods, um, the refugee uh, issue that has been a strong uh, drive as well. Um, how come climate action is part of the agenda today and what is, how does this come together uh, uh, for the foundation? Yeah, thank you, Jesper. I love that question because often when we talk about climate change, we think about the science, we think about industry and all sorts of things, but refugees, for example, help put a very human face on the climate crisis. And if you ask yourself, you know, what is a refugee? A refugee is an involuntary migrant. And the mm. climate change is at the very heart of why refugees were forced to migrate in the first place. Because after decades of warming the planet, the results of extreme drought and hunger or soil degradation, extreme mm. storms and, and sea level rise, and even conflict, strife and war, Climate is at the center of those things because we have destroyed the environment that has then forced people to leave. So our global aspiration on climate is especially important to preventing future refugee crises, for example, because by reducing global warming, we're also helping to restore biodiversity, soil health, and much else that is necessary so that people can thrive where they live. That is so important. And our foundation even has a portfolio that works on agricultural livelihoods that is looking at regenerative processes. So that will also reinforce this idea. Um, but your question is even broader than that about livelihoods in general. And if I, if I could just add, you know, refugees might be the most prominent example of human misery that we see as a result of climate. But we're also mindful that so many people in this transition are going to have difficulties adjusting to a low carbon world. And so in our programs, we're also thinking about how we bring about a fair and just transition. That is the news around it. And we're in the beginning of some of these processes but I encourage you to stay tuned because in the future, mm. we're going to talk about that a lot more. Very good. Thank you. Just as a comment also to say that I think it, uh, I was actually a bit uh, puzzled in the beginning, but now when you explain it, it makes all the sense that to prevent issues in the future and actually how climate is totally connected with uh, livelihoods, families. Um, so, and which just like in the vaccine topic, for example, we're all connected, right? I need to be part of the solution. Lovely. Yeah, completely connected. And we want people to have the opportunity to thrive. So Jesper, here's my next question. We don't just share a name, but we also share a lot of partners and ideas, including the World Green Building Council. Um, can mm. you share some of your plans to make the stores, the built environment of your stores, more climate neutral? Yep. So there is a couple of defined activities ongoing. Obviously, new buildings um, and new projects are, in a way, much easier. So one of the agendas that we are on to now, which is uh, uh, important for us, is like the retrofitting of um, our stores and make them net zero uh, from a climate perspective. Investments in both uh, where the energy comes from, uh, insulation and other, other uh, means for how we actually reduce the use of energy. Um, then I would say one of the coolest things I think uh, the IKEA system has done is to quite early on start to, to shift assets and invest in renewable energy production. So today, uh, Inca Group has an asset of 2.5 billion euro, 2.5 billion euro invested in renewable, mostly wind, a bit of solar as well. Um, and on top of that, we recently announced uh, adding 4 billion euro to that, uh, leading up to 6.5 uh, billion euro investment in renewable energy by 2030. Now, the money is not about buying so to say what's already been put out there but it's really stimulating adding new uh, renewable energy to the total grid and obviously our priority number one is to uh, connect wherever we can connect the um, uh, the source of the energy to our own uh, um, uh, needs of energy uh, today it's not matching fully so actually we have invested in more renewable than we consume ourselves and then we are on the way to make sure that it's also in the future one-to-one -one, uh, so that all of our stores uh, but also DCs and other operations are actually 
neutral or positive from an uh, uh, energy point of view. So these are some of the examples that we are addressing right now. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's good. Supplier. Also here, I would say, Liz, it's quite f fascinating. And I will be maybe like a parrot in this, uh, 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 but it's actually really good business. When we started, it was a very defensive uh, with a question mark whether it would ever make sense from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. And we are very happy from a business perspective. We took that uh, decision and we are getting closer to being independent from energy, which is, is not a bad thing as well. So it's yet another good example, I think, that we hope can inspire others. Yeah. So, Liz, over to you. Um, <laughs> so what is the uh, foundation's role and what, what are the activities that you are undertaking right now when it comes to transport and zero emission transports? Okay, so zero emission transport is a big dream of ours and it requires a complete shift. So if you think historically, for example, about when the world went from radio to television or when we went from landlines to mobile phones, you know, it wasn't enough just to have the available technology. You needed to have a supportive regulatory environment, you needed to make sure that there was enough investment in infrastructure. And there had to be a shift even in behaviors of people, of customers who would look at the new product and say, this is going to make my life better. So for it to be a natural choice on zero emission transport, we fund a whole range of partners on those very kinds of process issues that I just described. Climate Works, the European Climate Foundation, they're all working to advance zero emissions transport and even initiatives like EV100 that help businesses who own or lease big vehicle fleets to start making the plans to convert those from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Um, so there's an entire range of issues, even down to the, the, the narratives or the ways that people, we need to dispel for people, for example, what we call range anxiety, that I'll only be able to go a little further than my driveway if I buy an electric car. So these are part of the, the larger process when you really try to invest in a change that's as systemic as this. But there's another important way that we're supporting um, the zero emission vehicle dream that's less obvious, and that's through air quality. Uh, we realized a while ago that not everyone was going to connect to zero emission transport simply because of the idea of a vehicle, but they needed other um, ways to understand the problem. And in many, many cities, uh, of course, internal combustion engines have contributed significantly to very bad air quality. And so we were a founding funder of something called the Clean Air Fund. In fact, one of our five um, videos of partners shows the CEO of the Clean Air Fund, Jane Burston, which I hope everyone will also watch. Um, and respiratory health and um, the chronic disease burden that gets carried as a result of, of air pollution. And what happens is the Clean Air Fund helps to illuminate both um, people who are making decisions around this, but also everyday people, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, or a business leader, to connect and demand more of your lawmakers so that we can realize the, the prospect of breathing free and easy. So those two things are so twinned together that one actually serves the other. And it makes a lot of sense because, especially as we're now coming out of what I hope will be the COVID crisis, Breathing is such a fundamentally important thing. And so we're proud to be a part of that journey in those two different, very significant ways. Very clear. Thank you. Okay, Jesper. So buildings and transport, these are among some of the hot topics for the upcoming UN Climate Conference uh, meeting in November that will take place in Glasgow in the UK. So does IKEA have any other specific COP26? Yeah. No, but maybe maybe to start with, uh, to say that we, we believe there are several shifts in society that needs to happen. Um, to address climate change uh, requires more than any foundation, any company or any state can do on their own. So it's a truly interesting phenomenon that we are observing right now, the, the pain and the challenges, but also the breakthroughs and the successes of collaboration in new ways. Um, uh, we show up uh, when it comes to the energy uh, transition, um, how the infrastructure of energy, uh, which is, um, I would say, has passed the uh, tipping point. Um, I would say on the transport side, as you, you shared with us, we are probably right now in this moment passing the tipping point where, where the future is uh, electrified or other means, uh, so to say, which is also means that um, for all of us out there that you need to be 
on the forefront if you want to capture the benefits of it, which we do also in uh, in the retail side with um, the ambition to be 100% electric vehicle for all home deliveries by 2025. It's a tough ambition actually to reach. We have managed already in some places, but um, not not all. But let's see if we manage until 25. Now to your question, COP um, is uh, incre incredibly uh, interesting. It's the world coming together, not this time, I think, so much to acknowledge climate crisis or, or ask um, people to sign up for it, but more sign up for the actions. So this time is going to be all about the actions. And our contribution, except for being part influencing in different ways would be to try to if we can be a bridge between ordinary people and the uh, decision makers of different uh, uh, kinds since we are connected to millions and millions of customers out there and we stay in touch with them regularly on their questions and their concerns and to what extent um, their truth becomes um, i think an important uh, um, input to regard and vice versa that the stories of hope um, solutions are brought out there um, so we would try that and see if we can link somehow and secondly i would say uh, we will do what i think a few can do and that is to lead with examples of what we've done what we're doing what we will do not at least in our arena life at home to say that each one of us in our families in our households can actually contribute not only the decisions we take as consumers uh, but also the uh, operational agenda of any family, basically, choosing the right type of light bulbs, as you discussed um, uh, previously, how you waste, sort, how you uh, spend the right amount of energy, water, etc., in your home. So we will actually launch a uh, take on that in all our stores well before uh, COP, and we will try to show up and, and share solutions and talk less about the obvious uh, fact of the problem. So that's going to be what we will do. And I think the uh, next question here is actually because I know that you will also be active before and during the event there. Uh, could you share a little bit about your plans as well? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to say is that when the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, it told us the what, but it didn't always tell us the how. And as you rightfully point out, there's no longer a debate about the climate crisis, but when these delegates come together and when all of the outsiders come together, there still are things that need to be worked through on the how, how we define this, how we trade that, how we reach agreement on, on some of the, the more intricate parts of the agreement. So we fund several processes that help that. One is called the Climate Emergency Collaboration Group. And that spreads resources so that the right expertise is available in the room so that delegates can make very good informed decisions so that they have the latest scientific knowledge and understanding of the trade-offs and the implications of how they might decide on a particular topic. We also, and that happens inside the, the tent, um, as we say, at the uh, negotiations. But then there's a lot of things that are happening in the outside world, and that matters so much to us as a foundation as well. And so CECG, this group that we also fund, helps support the many civic society organizations that are also trying to have their voices heard on behalf of the many people in 196 countries that are a part of this agreement, because there are a number of issues, key issues that are at stake, including for very vulnerable countries, how the more fortunate countries are going to produce a financial package um, that was estimated at $100 billion a year to help them with their adaptation and their mitigation needs. And that's just one of the many, many issues. So CECG is one group that we've been funding now for over a year to help bring that collaboration, that unprecedented collaboration mm -hmm. we talk about together. Another one, because the United Kingdom is hosting the COP this year, is we're funding something called the UK Countryside Climate Network, which brings together mayors and decision makers and businesses and citizens from small towns across the entire UK who have said, we're gonna go net zero, but we need our governments to hear us more about what we need to do that. Because often the big cities can make the biggest noise, but the smaller towns are so important to the lifeblood of a society. And so this Countryside Climate Network is campaigning and raising awareness around what they're doing. And then finally, thanks to the fact that we have such an amazing um, communications uh, department here and colleagues that work night and day on bringing stories forward, 
we've been doing profiles on our change makers, on the people who stand behind the grants that we give so that you can actually see the human face and hear the story of why people are working on what they're working. And we're really hoping that um, by the time the COP arrives, we'll not only have more of those stories, but we're thinking about ways to bring more voices of the many people into the COP. So stay tuned. Um, you might see more um, on that topic as well. And, um, and now, Jesper, I think this leads to, to maybe one of my last questions, and it also relates to the COP. So if you had two minutes on the main stage at COP26 to speak to world leaders with their mm. undivided attention, what would you say to them? Yeah, I, I think um, I would be tempted to say a lot, but I think the most important thing of what I would take the opportunity is to say, uh, in a way, good intentions are, of course, needed and words make them powerful, but now it's about actions. So I think uh, I and I think we should be on that um, uh, agenda. And that means both uh, talking about the importance of action, but also sharing the good examples uh, to share that because it will, will spark... Uh, and feed so many more um, actions that are needed. Um, so the good examples and the actions, um, and also point that, that this is not about the theoretical exercise any longer. We need to act now. Um, it's our generation, it's this decade when these actions need to be put in place. Um, I think to, to um, companies, I would say, take the leap of faith and um, uh, you better be earlier than later into this transition because not only might you miss out on the economic benefits, but also your brand might be in deep trouble if you uh, fail uh, uh, people on this question. To, to governments, leaders of governments, um, uh, EU, etc., I would say uh, that the uh, instrument of blunt taxation is uh, probably needed, but it's far too slow. Um, therefore, we need, uh, we need to incentivize and support incentivize the new behaviors, the transition of energy, consumption, etc., it's not so much to innovate, uh, but actually to scale out what we already know. And now I already said uh, too much, and now that we have maybe have fallen asleep, but action would be my message. I think you can get that point across in your two minutes without any problem. And I think because IKEA is leading with examples all the time, um, you, you put your money where your mouth is. So that's really powerful too. We're trying. So Liz, uh, two years from now, uh, uh, what do you think will be different? What what were, were we talking about the same things or where are we going to be? Well, two years from now, we'll be in 2023. And that's the year when we do a global stock take. When I say we, I mean the entire climate community and, and a group of really talented scientists. And what the global stock take will tell us is whether or not our actions up to this point have set us correctly on a course, whether we can see that in data and evidence, to have our emissions by 2030, because that is the crucial um, you know, marking point. And if the global stock take tells us that it hasn't produced that kind of data, so if action slows, you and I might be sitting here again talking about the same things, the importance of action. But I actually have a more hopeful outcome, um, not only inspired by the example of what IKEA does, but we're privileged to be able to see so many companies, new, new commitments by investors, as I mentioned, even countryside mayors who are coming forward and people that we keep talking about who are anxious and desiring of greater change and are asking for it. And the innovation is there. And as you said, a lot of these things we can just scale. We know what needs to be done. So I have enormous faith in people and in their commitment to come together and to make those solutions work and to make it possible. And I just have to say that, you know, as, as part of a team personally that, that helps to build solutions for this better future, it's such a privilege as well as a responsibility to be able to do this kind of work. So to our audience of many coworkers out there, of course, we wanna thank you for everything that you do, because um, it's thanks to your efforts that we're able to have the resources that we use as a foundation to make these solutions possible. And, and Jesper, I, I have to say that um, two years from now, I'm really hoping that you and I have a, a really great celebratory conversation where we can look back and say, look at how much more we did than we thought was possible 
Look at how many more have joined us in action. That is going to be a real shifting point. You spoke earlier, for example, about 2025 maybe being that tipping point on electric vehicles, and I'm right there with you. I think we're we're seeing it. I think it's it's cresting, and I think that there are a number of initiatives that are moving forward that are going to make these kinds of shifts. Like I said before, we went from radio to TV and from landlines to mobile phones, and it seemed effortless. It's not effortless, of course, but it's fully within the realm of the possible. And as we both know, in our generation, in our lifetime, this is the greatest global challenge we have ever confronted. And so I'm hoping that two years from now, we're gonna feel very confident that we're gonna get there. Mm. Um, at least that's my that's my really yeah. sincere hope. I, yeah. I share your optimism. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. Yes, Bert, I wanna thank you so much. It's such a delight to see you and to be able to talk with you. And to our audience members, I encourage you please to Join future sessions, um, download the virtual reality app, check out our videos so that you can learn more about our work. And of course, whenever you have questions, we're happy to answer them. So thank you so much. Air pollution is a global problem. Nine out of 10 of us breathing air that's really harmful to our health. I'm Jane, and I'm on a mission to ensure that everyone can breathe clean air. The IKEA Foundation is committed to tackling the climate crisis and ensuring that families and children have a healthy environment in which they can thrive. They support the Clean Air Fund, an organization founded by Jane Burston that is working to improve air quality around the world and thereby reduce climate change. The first time I really thought hard about air pollution was when I moved to central London. I used to cycle to work every day and I'd wear a mask uh, because there was lots of, lots of traffic. And at the end of the week, the filter in the back of that mask was black. I thought, this is going into my lungs. This is really unhealthy and I need to do something about this. The Clean Air Fund is a philanthropic organisation funding projects to reduce air pollution. We are working with grassroots organisations and governments to tackle that and to find new solutions. We focus on all different parts of the world because pollution is bad everywhere. We have a project in Poland that have managed to get various changes to laws banning very dirty stoves and making sure that the funds are available for people to replace them. And we've worked on a fantastic project in China with local government there, um, mapping pollution around the city so that they can detect hotspots 10 times more often than they could before and then send enforcement officers to check whether people and industry are breaching the rules. We've come across some massively inspirational people like Dr. Kumar, one of India's leading lung surgeons. He's seen over the decades more and more people coming into his surgery that have never smoked, but their lungs look like they have. That's caused him to go and campaign for clean air across India. I've met Rosamond Kisai Deborah, whose daughter tragically died because of an asthma attack brought on by air pollution near her home in South London. Her daughter is the first person in the world to have air pollution written as the cause of death on her death certificate. And she's campaigning for changes in law in the UK so that this can never happen to another child. Tackling air pollution is absolutely achievable. I know it because every day I'm lucky enough to meet the people fighting for clean air for their communities and their families. The IKEA Foundation brings hope to families, young people and vulnerable children around the world. They support partners that empower people in low-income communities to create sustainable livelihoods and tackle climate change to ensure that there is a livable planet for future generations. <laughs>